Hi, my name is Aaron Gers. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Ash Clinical News. Welcome to our on-site coverage of the Ash Annual Meeting for 2024. It's my absolute pleasure here to be uh, joined by Drs. Gupta and Rao uh, to discuss their abstract presented at the plenary session uh, on uh, pediatric ALL. So welcome and uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. All right. So as someone who treats, you know, full-sized pediatric patients <laughs> or adults, um, you know, to me, I, I look at the outcomes of childhood ALL and it's, it's amazing where it's come and, and the outcomes are so great, especially compared to some adult outcomes. Why, why, why mess with a good thing? Why add blinitumumab into that regimen? Yeah, it's a fair question for sure. And, you know, outcomes have improved in these huge stepwise gains from the 70s through the 90s and early 2000s. And then we just hit a plateau mm -hmm. and then we were making no progress despite the conduct of lots of clinical trials that were trying to move that needle. And, I, you know, I, I think 90% cure rate sounds pretty good, but if you're the parent of a child and you say your child has a one in 10 chance of dying from this yeah. disease, that's not good enough yeah. to us. There are also subsets of patients who we know still have much worse outcomes than that, you know, number. Um, and so there's a huge need, you know, BALL is the most common childhood cancer. And even with those cure rates, it still is a second leading cause of cancer death among children just because of the numbers. Um, so I don't think any pediatric oncologist was happy to settle for 90%. Um, so we knew that chemo wasn't gonna cut it and blinitumab had a lot of data at the time, at least in relapse setting, that it was well tolerated and was showing a really striking efficacy signal even in those early studies. And so we sort of made the leap and said, this is worth studying in a population who are already doing well because we think if anything can really move the needle, this is going to be it. Yeah, it's definitely done so in adult medicine as well. It's like kind of moved from, you know, back lines up to the front line now uh, for our patients with adult ALL. Um, you know, so also treating adults, you know, I'm familiar with the number of cycles. And so for, for your study, you included two cycles of Blina as opposed to one or four. I've been done in other studies. Any, any inclination of why two or versus others? So uh, we always joke that we should probably come up with this really sophisticated, impressive yeah. sounding rationale to, <laughs> because we get asked that question a lot. There was not yeah. a, such a rationale. You know, at, you know, at the time that we were designing the study, which is almost a decade ago now, there was absolutely still evidence for blinitumab, but there wasn't a lot of the evidence that we have yeah. now for a certain number of cycles. So at the time, the Children's Oncology Group relapse trial, ALL1331, we didn't have results from the, that study either, but the way that was designed, children with high risk relapse were getting two cycles of blinitumab, and children with low risk relapse were getting three cycles of blinitumab interspersed within their chemotherapy cycles. So really, we sort of went back and forth two versus three. Um, and it was really trying to balance both wanting to have efficacy, but also, you know, as I think most of your viewers will know, the logistical burden on families yeah. for blenitumab is pretty significant as well. So in the end, we ended up with two. I think it is, you know, a really interesting question now with these results, with the E1910 results, with the Interfant mm -hmm. infant results, you know, Blina seems to have had pretty impressive efficacy whether you use one cycle or two cycles or four cycles. Yeah. So I think what is the ideal number of cycles and for which population, I think those are questions that we're going to have to look into going forward. Yeah, and it's always interesting thinking about the balance of, of efficacy, you know, are we getting diminishing returns by adding more cycles versus like the health economics outcome research, right. what that'll tell us, like, you know, the costs of the medications, or even the simple thing of like time and chair, right? So we talk a lot about time toxicity now in, in the care of our patients, like, how long does it take them to get to the cancer center? How long does it take to hook them up to the bag of Blenna and then come back for their bag changes and all these types of things? I think those are really inter interesting questions that could be addressed in the future. Mm -hmm. um, one of, you know, one of the most striking things I think you showed in your in your work was that uh, standard risk and high risk patients had very similar outcomes in terms of uh, progression free survival, right? And over and, and and it was really remarkable to see kind of the risks, the risk groups almost like line up on those curves. So, uh, any speculation? Well, well, why why all of a sudden these curves kind of come together? Yeah, I mean, I, I think historically a lot of the genetic changes in the cancer cells probably drive resistance to the standard chemotherapies that we've been using forever. Um, but that seems to not be the case for blinitumab. Now, we're gonna have to do a lot more genomic sequencing of all the samples collected from these patients to understand a little bit better if there is a risk factor for now not responding to blinitumab as well as other patients. 
But all those sort of traditional risk factors that we've used forever to risk stratify seem to be neutralized to an extent with blenitumumab. And I think it's because they all express CD19 on the cell surface and your T cells, as long as they're functioning normally, seem to be able to kill whatever leukemic blast blenitumumab happens to be attached to. Um, so I, I think it's a fantastic question. I think it was one of the most exciting things that we saw from this. We saw kids with KMT2A rearrangements having an 11 point jump in their disease free survival, yeah. hypodiploidy actually having decent outcomes. It was, it's pretty striking. Um, so it's, you know, I think a lot of work will have to go into the biology of that response, um, but it's pretty cool to see kids who have historically had really dismal outcomes now getting to a point where they're equal to those with our favorable risk yeah. disease, yeah. There was um, a period of time, obviously, where we as co-chairs knew the results, but hadn't yet been able yeah. to disseminate them to the to the COG community and all the participating trial sites. And I remember, you know, in our weekly leukemia rounds that week, a colleague of mine presenting a kid with NCI standard risk disease who ended up having neutral cytogenetics and a relatively high MRD level at the end of induction, right? And everyone's kind of groans a little bit and like, okay, well, we should do this and maybe we refer them to BMT just to get HIV yeah. typing starting, et cetera, et cetera, the usual, right? Yeah, yeah. And in my mind, I'm like screaming like, <laughs> no, goodness. like this is still a 94% EFS, yeah. right? Like you just don't know it yet, but you will soon. And it's, oh, it really does completely change the tenor of how we think of a lot of these kids, it's yeah. disease. Well, that's fantastic. No, it, it, again, that, a, a very impressive result for, for the study. Um, you know, looking at some of the relapses that occurred, you know, it seems like uh, I think a quarter of the patients, or approximately a quarter of the patients that did have a relapse, it was CNS-based, either CNS alone, isolated CNS to relapse, or CNS plus bone marrow relapse. Is there, and it, I, you know, I think it's pretty well known that BLIN doesn't get into the cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid or has effect there. So do we need to do CNS prophylaxis differently now or, or think about changing that part of the regimen? Yeah, it's an excellent question and one that, you know, in our discussions over the last six months within the children's oncology group and I think a, a lot of other groups as well have focused on, you know, I think we're, we're sort of stuck in a couple of places. One is that, yes, as you mentioned, Blina, both by this study and by lots of other ones, does not seem to have any impact on CNS mm -hmm. um, leukemia or the risk of CNS relapse. And so, in fact, you know, there's this sort of interesting progression you can see in 1731 where isolated CNS relapse used to be a very, very small yeah. percentage of the relapses we see in, in B cell ALL in kids. And that absolute number doesn't change when you give blind up, but all of a sudden as a proportion, it's a massive amount of your <laughs> relapses now, right? So it yeah. also has implications for how we think of relapse studies and you know needing to focus on this population more. I think the problem is that you know, we know what modalities we currently have to treat the CNS or mm -hmm. to prophylax yeah. the CNS, whether we're talking more intrathecals or radiation or high-dose methotrexate and all these sort of things. They all have pretty significant downsides as well mm -hmm. in terms of both short and late toxicity. And when you look at the absolute number of isolated CNS relapses, it's still very, very low, right? And we are much more crude in our ability to predict CNS relapse yeah. than we are bone marrow relapse, right? So we're sort of stuck at the moment with, do we intensify CNS-directed therapy for a large number of children, you know, with the accompanying long-term mm -hmm. and short-term side effects in the hope of preventing a small number of CNS relapses yeah. or not, right? And really, the answer, hopefully, is to learn more and get better in our ability to predict CNS relapse yeah. and to come up with novel methods of targeting the CNS for those children as well. Oh, well, very exciting. I look forward to hearing about that in the future once you guys figure that out. <laughs> um, it, you know, you've mentioned the Children's Ecology Group here a number of times, or COG. You know, what's it like putting together a COG study uh, getting it through all the various committees and CTEP and all these other acronyms. Uh, uh, you know, what's that experience like, you know, bringing together all these centers to do this kind of work? First off, I'll say, I mean, the Children's Oncology Group and our involvement, and I think we've commented several times, is probably the best thing that's happened in our career. The ALL committee is just this incredible group of people who are all humble and hardworking and generous and uh, really funny people and like normal <laughs> um, which is awesome um, and just so committed to the common cause I think um, and you know this there were literally 215 hospitals in Canada Australia New Zealand and the United States that opened and ran this trial 
And I actually, I started at Texas Children's when this trial opened and then I moved to Seattle. So I've seen how complicated it is to run in any hospital. Um, you have to figure out how to deliver blenitumab by a continuous IV for 28 days in a row. Mm -hmm. And at Texas Children's, we, it took us six months to figure that out. <laughs> you know, it was burdensome. So the commitment of the centers to this trial and to enrolling patients and their um, commitment to moving the science forward in a collaborative effort is pretty tremendous to see, right? Um, so I don't know, I think the Children's Oncology Group and other consortia probably feel this very same way. Um, that you know we're the lucky two that get to sit here and talk about <laughs> these awesome results, which is amazing. But we are but two of literally probably thousands of people who made this happen because each and every center contributed to this, for sure. And I think I mean you know the, the way you phrased your question, I might um, shade a little bit, right? Like how do you bring together all these sites? It wasn't bringing them together, right? It's the sites have the passion and have yeah. bought into this mission. That's why they do this and put all this time and effort into it, right? We just happen to be the people who were able to, like, channel that with all of the rest of the committee into something. You know, um, again, that first week when we paused enrollment for the study, but we weren't able to yet. You know, there's that week period between pausing enrollment, very suddenly as we knew yeah. these results and then being able to say why, and the number of emails we got from sites of um, in varying amounts of distress, and in some cases even anger, like, no, I have a child who wants to go on this study, no. like, how can I you can, not oh, be no. letting me into it, right? We're like, no, yeah. this is a really good reason why, yeah. I promise, but, um, but again, it was just, we kept saying to each other, right, it, it was just a marker of how passionately sites, and not just pediatric oncologists, right, but the CRAs and the pharmacists and the nurses and the nurse practitioners and a whole bunch of other people feel about this common mission of, yeah. like, designing and executing um, clinical trials to keep improving outcomes. Yeah. I, I'm so glad you, you, you have that message. Uh, um, you know, as again, someone who treats uh, full-sized children, <laughs> uh, you know, I feel a lot of those pressures too, right? So there's the pressure to create more revenue, and there's an increasing focus on the business of medicine, and and uh, you know, we all worry that it's at the uh, expense of the mission of medicine. You know, to make people better, to advance the science, to to make lives better for everyone. And and I think it's such an important message to say that this this is why we're here. You know, this is we're here to push the field forward. Here to make lives better for our patients. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. So, yeah. I'm thankful for for all the work that you do, and then the the work that the Children's Oncology Group does. So, uh, towards the towards the end of our conversation here, you know, I have to ask you. Know, is this now the standard of care? So if you have a patient that comes to your clinic tomorrow um, or whenever you get back to your home institutions uh, and then you're, you're seeing them in clinic and they have this diagnosis, is this, is this the thing to do? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, it's not even a caveat, I think the, um, the corollaries to that mm -hmm. is, you know, we have a group of patients that we call standard risk favorable, this group of patients, which is not a small number, who because of their leukemia genetics, who because of their early response to therapy, we know they have an excellent yeah. outcome without blenitumab, right? And again, blenitumab, logistics, cost, side effect profile, right? So that group, I think most centers would agree there's probably not a role for yeah. blenitumab. I think the um, kind of on the other side of the ledger, our trial was just NCI standard risk yeah. patients, right? And E1910 was 30 to 70 year olds. So we have this sort of like gap, yeah. right, in yeah. between. And if you were going to be a 100% evidence purist, you would say that we don't know whether blinitumab will have the same effect there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, though, at least in children's oncology group hands, those patients are treated with the exact same backbone yep. that we used in the standard risk high patients. Many of those patients are the same age, they just had higher white counts yep. on presenting. And it's really hard for me anyways, and I think for most of us, to hypothesize a reason why blinitumab would have this significant effect in younger kids, significant effect in 30 to 70 yep. year olds, but nothing but in But nothing in between. between. Doesn't there, make sense. There, it doesn't, yeah. right? There are some trials in Europe and other yeah. places that are actually, actually are investigating the role of blinitumab in, in sort of subsets within that group. But I would say that, and I think most of us would believe that that group deserves the benefit yeah. of blinitumab as well. So. Would we give this to our patients now? Yes. And what was, I think, one of the coolest parts of this is, you know, we learned of these results early July and we released a memo a week and a half later mm -hmm. letting sites know this result and the impact 
on patient care and just seeing almost just an overnight movement to incorporate yeah. this into the care of children right now. Yeah. Like I never thought I would be a part of that in my entire career. It was just striking and remarkable. I'm like, oh my gosh, like something we uh, you know, participated in and contributed to has literally changed in front of my eyes yeah. what's happening right here, right now. It's pretty cool. If I can say one thing, we've tried to emphasize this whenever we get asked this question as well. I think what was also um, eye-opening for us in that process, as amazing as everyone's efforts were, is hearing stories mm -hmm. from different physicians, different treating sites, mm -hmm. about the family who understood this new evidence, but lived in a rural remote area and just couldn't make it happen to come and get their blend of tube map, right? Or didn't have the home care resources, or et cetera, et cetera. There are reasons why yeah. Children and families have not been able to access this, even in the face of these results. And you know, as amazing as the effect of Blina seems to be, you actually need to get the Blina, obviously, yeah. to get that effect, right? So even putting aside the global aspect of it, right, and how do kids outside of privileged countries like Canada, the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and Europe get this? You know, even within our own countries, making sure that we spend just as much time and effort thinking about how can every kid who should be able to access this and benefit from it actually it. do so. You know, it's great to get the Ash Plenary, the New England Journal paper and all that sort of stuff, but I think we need just as much post effort as a community and as a society to make sure that that access happens as well. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely, you know, even in the adult world, that's the same thing. Like, there's patients out there making very difficult choices about do I take my treatment or do I you know, buy groceries, honestly. And um, I think, you know, getting access for everyone, no matter what your disease is or, or what your treatment is, is, is so incredibly important for our patients. There was, a, there was a paper we saw presented earlier about um, that was a single center in China giving blenitumab to kids yeah. before these results were known, obviously, and trying to see what the effect of it was. And they gave anywhere from two weeks of Blina to two full cycles. And someone in the audience asked, like, what determined that? And they very frankly said, the ability of the parents to pay, That's great. right? Yeah. And so I think that is the reality for yeah. many more children with BALL than yeah. it isn't, right? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, sharing today, uh, the, the work that you've done. Uh, thank you, wonder, congratulations on a wonderful presentation and abstract number one, right? <laughs> uh, at the uh, ASH annual meeting this year. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today, discussing these, uh, this abstract uh, presented by uh, Dr. Rao and Dr. Gupta. And you, uh, it's so amazing to see. You know, so Ash Clinical News now has been around for 10 years. And so in that time, we've seen such amazing advances in, in, in hematology and the care of patients with the hematologic disorders like blinitumab. It's just kind of cool to see it go from phase one to like you know, second line therapies now into the front line setting for a lot of our patients and totally revolutionize the way we take care of ALL. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for your time and engagement today. Uh, thank you again for watching. And you can read about this abstract and all of our on-site coverage in Ash Clinical News.